Hi, I'm Steve Palumbi, and this is Lecture 7 in the Science of the Extreme Life of the Sea. And what we're going to talk about today is being big, evolving large size of animals in the ocean, uh, the ecology of being big, some of the physiological problems uh, that happen, and um, the sort of sensitivity of size and extinction rates in the past and, and then in the future. When we, look, when we look at the ocean today um, and we think about big things, uh, we naturally think about the whales because they're the biggest animals in the ocean now. Um, and in fact, they have been the biggest animals in the ocean for a couple of million years, and they're the biggest animals that have ever lived on planet Earth. So why now do we have a special kind of animal that is bigger than has ever been before? How do they get so big? And what are some of the, the special problems that they have uh, in being able to attain such a uh, large size? Um, and big means very big. Compared to elephants, blue whales are about 40 times uh, the weight. Um, they uh, basically don't have to stand on their legs on land like elephants. So you might think, well, it doesn't matter how big they are because they're all supported, their weight is supported by the ocean. Um, but they still have a problem in how much food can they eat, what their metabolism is, what their daily needs are for, uh, for energy, and how, how they meet that is a big problem for animals that have evolved that, that size. Now, there are other ways of being big than growing like a whale, and later on we'll talk a little bit about these kinds of creatures. This is also a very big animal. It's a coral named Big Mama on the island of Tau in American Samoa, and uh, weight-wise it's as big or bigger than a blue whale. It grows in a very different way. They live a lot longer. They have a totally different organization of how they, how they act as an animal, what they live how they live and how they feed. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. But back to whales, where do they come from? How have they gotten so big? We go back in the fossil record uh, and can see that the lineage that has evolved into whales split from uh, our more familiar terrestrial mammals, the hippopotamuses, about 55 million years ago. We have a pretty good fossil record of the transitions from a fully terrestrial animal um, called Pachycetus, which is the ancestor of all the whales now, um, to a more and more aquatic lifestyle. So over the period of time from 50 to 45 to 40 million years ago, this lineage of animals um, gradually became more and more aquatic, uh, like Ambulocetus, uh, is the first one that has swimming legs. Uh, basically, the back legs are, are for swimming. The front legs are beginning to be a bit, a bit shorter. And as more and more transitions to a fully aquatic lifestyle take place, then uh, what we see is a more of a shift towards um, to what we would recognize now as a modern cetacean, the whales and dolphins. Now, our modern two types of whales, the odontocetes or the tooth whales, the mysticetes or the baleen whales, split about uh, 40 million years ago. And they're the only lineages left of this long series of evolutionary changes that have led to, to modern whales. Uh, right now, most of the cetaceans, that is this group together, are not big. Most of them are actually quite small, uh, but there have been a couple instances where um, the animals have evolved to large size. Well, uh, the largest whales, the blue whales, um, have a particular need to feed an enormous amount. And they've also evolved the ability uh, to feed uh, on very peculiar prey because in this case, the largest animals are feeding on some of the smallest prey in the ocean. This particular shot is of a blue whale lunge feeding. That's where the whale opens its mouth, its throat slats, uh, elongate, and the whale takes up an enormous gulp of water, up to a third or a half, or in some cases, uh, even more the volume of the whale is essentially captured in one gulp of, of the ocean. Then, of course, the baleen is used to filter out that water, trapping the plankton inside. And that's what baleen whales eat. Small plankton, krill, which are small crustaceans, sometimes small fish. 
but they can't get them or take them one at a time. That's totally inefficient. They have to basically eat large prey concentrations of, their, of these planktonic organisms. Um, so this is a video that uh, shows a blue whale coming in, approaching a patch of krill, opening its mouth, kind of doing a side swipe. You can see that lunge, the huge amount of water that goes into the throat uh, of the whale, then it comes back and dives down. Uh, as it's diving down, it's using its tongue to push the water towards the front of the mouth, which is where the baleen is, and then uh, essentially filter out the plankton, swallow that, and then be ready for the next gulp. Uh, the ability to do that is shared by this set of baleen whales, uh, but even among those baleen whales, not all of them are big. So this phylogenetic tree shows two things. It shows the division of modern uh, cetaceans uh, from some of the, the, the original of the toothed whales that evolved into baleen whales, uh, and then uh, the set of evolutionary relationships among the modern baleen whales. Um, now, the, the diagram itself is colored with the size of the animals. Um, and redder means uh, larger. I want to focus on this part of this diagram in order to basically be able to see where the largest whales have evolved. And what you can see is the, um, the red color is um, concentrated on this part of the phylogenetic tree. Redis with Balenoptera musculus, which is the blue whale, um, but we also have um, fin whales and say whales and Broides whales. Um, and uh, humpback whales in this, in this set of, of individuals. Where did they evolve and when did the, wa the large uh, size come in? It really didn't start being apparent until about five to 10 million years ago. Um, before that, we didn't have such large baleen whales, um, but this large size of, has evolved relatively recently in the history of life on the planet, just in this last five to 10 million years. Well, what might have gone on that is associated with the shift from relatively small um, baleen whales, like minke whales or baleen whales, they're not all that big. Uh, what ha has happened in the history of the ocean um, associated with that? Well, it's not completely locked down and understood exactly. Um, but over the last five to 10 million years, patterns in the ocean uh, that lead to accumulation of large patches of prey probably have changed. And that pattern in the ocean is called upwelling. Uh, this graph sort of shows the, um, the shift in ice volumes over time um, measured by an isotope of oxygen. And as uh, the Eocene, changed at 20 million years, changed in the Pliocene, and then we ended up the Pleistocene ice ages, the ice volume has changed um, dramatically. That's thought to be associated uh, with changes in ocean upwelling that made it more and more and more common along certain shores um, of the sea. Now, what is upwelling? Upwelling is a, is a feature of coastal oceans um, that uh, is, generated uh, when wind blows along the shore, that tends to move the water um, along the shore and then offshore. Um, the water moving offshore is then replaced by deep water that comes from underneath, comes up to the surface, and then comes back out. Now, that upwelling of deep water brings with it very different ocean conditions than the shallow water um, was there originally. In particular, what we have with upwelled water is that we've got um, cooler water coming in towards this warmer surface water. The cooler water is um, also low in oxygen and high in nutrients. When that high nutrient water um, hits the surface, it leads to a bloom in plankton, particularly the phytoplankton that use the nutrients, then zooplankton uh, come in to feed on those phytoplankton, and that re results in a large increase in the productivity of coastal areas when they are affected by upwelling. 
like this. In fact, if you look at the uh, presence of upwelling in different parts of the ocean, uh, upwelling regions are only about 1% of the coastal regions in the planet, but they make up up to about 50% of the fisheries uh, in the planet because of the high productivity, the high production of phytoplankton, zooplankton, and then larger species uh, like krill, the crustaceans that whales eat, anchovies and sardines that we eat, and that also um, the baleen whales eat, eat as well. So it's thought that the relationship between upwelling and productivity creates patches of prey. Those patches of prey um, are big enough now for a large animal like a blue whale to get enough food by essentially enveloping and gulping down those big patches. Whereas in the past, those patches were either smaller or they didn't exist. And so that kind of huge animal eating small prey was something that was very difficult uh, to evolve. In part two of this lecture about being big, we're going to talk about fish because they have a peculiar relationship with size. It's very different than the kind of relationship that whales have. In the case of fish, it's not really a question of um, them having trouble getting enough food. In the case of fish, it's a question of them being able to breathe. Well, oxygen use in fish uh, in, in almost everything depends upon body size. The larger the mass of the organism, the more oxygen that it takes. Um, and for fish, they're getting their oxygen uh, from their gills. They are filtering water with the gills, pulling oxygen out. And so the oxygen capacity they have, the capacity of pulling oxygen out of the water, depends upon the gill area that they have, whereas their oxygen need depends upon their body size. And if those were perfectly matched, then everything would be fine. But in fact, gill area often doesn't keep pace with body size when the animal's growing. Uh, that's shown in this graph for, for sharks. Um, body size is on the x-axis and uh, the gill respiratory area is on the y-axis. And if there was a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, we'd see a line going up like this that would keep going as the animals got bigger and bigger. But what you can see here is that it flattens out and larger animals yeah, the gills are still increasing in size as they, as they get bigger, but not fast enough to keep up with the actual weight. Um, different graph, same conclusion from a different fish. In this case, uh, as, the, as the animals get bigger, we see a strong shift in the size of the gills. Um, again, they're still getting bigger as the fish gets bigger, uh, but at a rate that is not as um, fast as the rate of change of body size. Well, you can take these two um, bits of data and divide them and get an idea of the gill area that is available to service the needs to provide oxygen for, for every gram of weight. Uh, so that's the gill area per body weight here. If we blow that up a little bit, then um, if the animal, as it grew, had exactly the same amount of gill area per body weight, no matter how big it was, uh, then this would just be a flat line. But what you can see from here is that uh, for this bony fish, this number drops precipitously as the animal gets, gets bigger. Now there's a, a minimum, there's a minimum amount of gill area necessary to provide oxygen uh, for a certain amount of um, body mass, and that's this dotted line here. And if this line drops below the, the dotted line, then the animal simply doesn't have enough oxygen to meet its uh, metabolic needs. That will mean it doesn't have enough oxygen to meet its growth needs. It will mean it doesn't have enough oxygen uh, to meet its needs to escape predators or to um, produce eggs for the next generation. And so me being above this line is a crucial part of the ability of a, of a growing fish to sustain itself. That actually also depends a bit, not just on the fish, but the environment itself, uh, because that line, that minimum line, um, might not be attainable if there's not enough oxygen in the water. Warm water holds less oxygen than cool water. 
And so when a fish of a given size that might have enough oxygen in cool water moves into warmer water, then it might not be able to actually supply its whole bodily needs with oxygen. As a consequence, as oceans warm, some calculations like, uh, like this one has suggested that it might be that fish can't grow to the same size as they do now that they might actually only be able to attain 20 to 30% less of their maximum body size um, in order to be able to meet their oxygen needs. Um, so by reducing their size 20 to 30%, they might be able to still persist in warmer, less oxygenated water, but obviously for a fisheries standpoint, then that uh, becomes a problem with, uh, with future fisheries in, in cooler water. So uh, what this does is just take the, the normal way fish are using oxygen in the water and then explore the consequences of what happens as size changes uh, and then looking at the consequences of that in terms of the ability of fish to become bigger and bigger and the ability of them to survive the same way in, in future conditions. In part three of this lecture about being big, we'll talk about um, the consequences of large size in, in the future, in near future conditions that are very different because of climate change than the ones we have now. Um, in section two, I talked a little bit about fish size and how oxygen availability limits that and how in future warmer oceans that oxygen problem might be even worse. Uh, but the future oceans are likely to be different in a number of ways, not just, not just heat. Uh, there'll be high CO2 as more and more CO2 is put into the atmosphere because of fossil fuel use. Um, that causes the high heat because of greenhouse trapping of um, the sun's energy by CO2. Um, it also will cause more storms and higher sea level. Uh, all of these conditions are similar to the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, the last time that the oceans went through a strong extinction event. Um, so the question is if, if future conditions are gonna be similar to this mass extinction uh, event, will future conditions cause ocean extinctions? Um, and what's the nature of those ocean extinctions? Uh, recall that after a mass extinction, it takes millions of years for the ocean to come back to its normal state. Um, so a question about how long will it take for the oceans to come back after, say, a climate change extinction event. Well, if, we, if we look at the animals um, that are most at, rink, at risk in ex for extinction um, in, in our modern oceans, um, we see the following kinds of patterns. We see, for example, sea turtles, are currently under high risk of extinction. Uh, the marine mammals like sea otters, seabirds, uh, aquatic sea snakes all have a pretty high level of risk of extinction. Uh, these are all animals that are aquatic, they're oceanic animals, but they're also tied to land. Um, for marine organisms right now, there's actually quite a low risk per species of extinction, the highest ones um, being and the cetaceans. Um, and the low risk of many, many other species um, is because they have, tend to have wide ranges, large population sizes, um, and by and large, their habitats are not as, um, as affected and threatened as the habitats of marine or aquatic organisms that have some link to, um, to land. Well, we can also get a view of what the future is likely to hold um, by looking back in the past and seeing what were the kinds of features of organisms that uh, led to higher extinction rates in past mass extinctions. And how does that compare with the threat of extinctions in future conditions because of, because of climate change? So this is a graph of the relative uh, percent of the genera that went extinct at different points in the past. Back here at the, the last mass extinction, this is about where the PETM was as well, and high amounts of generic extinction, uh, in this case for fish um, vertebrates and for, uh, for mollusks. Uh, then over the last 50 million years or so, uh, there's been a relatively low um, pattern of extinction. 
of both of those types. And then in the future, there's a couple of different scenarios. Um, uh, uh, low estimate that is the future of climate change is relatively contained by redu reduction in emissions, or a high estimate where climate change future is not constrained um, by reduction of um, emissions. And you can see a big jump in the risk of extinction of genera of fish and mollusks, vertebrates and mollusks, um, on the level of what we would get, uh, what we did get with the last mass extinction. So it looks like future scenarios and past mass extinction scenarios um, are actually pretty similar in terms of the severity of the extinction. But what about the patterns of those extinctions, uh, the kinds of organisms that are, that are most at risk? Well, this uh, diagram goes back to the last mass extinction um, across five or tens of millions of years, um, all the way back to 50, 60, 65 million years. And what it's showing is the risk of extinction in different periods of time in the past, depending upon the ecology of the group that's being considered. And so, for example, um, this particular diagram shows the relative risk of larger species versus smaller species to extinction back in the past. And what you can see in this particular diagram is that um, larger species have relatively lower risk of extinction back in the past. Um, the coefficient is below zero there. Uh, whereas smaller species have a relatively higher had a relatively higher risk of extinction back in the past. Um, the patterns are a little less clear for all the other types of organisms, uh, whether they were motile, um, what they what they fed on, whether they're predators or or non-predators, um, and then what kind of habitat they lived in. Um, in that case, these diagrams are kind of these points are almost all over the map. There isn't a clear trend. It's really um, that the larger species had a less of a chance of going extinct in this last 60 million year period, and where smaller species had a higher had a higher chance. Well, um, let's compare that now uh, with the similar kinds of estimates from species not in the past, but in the future. This is essentially you know, similar kind of data, um, but then comparing in the red here, uh, the relative risk of extinction um, by species four species with these different ecological conditions. And um, again, for the other traits, um, there's less of a, of a, of a signal, um, but there's a pretty strong signal for size. That is, um, for modern species and for species that are essentially expected to go extinct in the future, then those extinction risks are much higher for larger species than for smaller ones. Uh, whereas in the past, the, the opposite um, was true. Um, here, uh, the pelagics have a very different kind of extinction risk than benthic species that is living on the, on the bottom. It's, it's about even for, um, for future species. So looking between the past and the, and the present, the biggest difference in extinction risk is size. Whereas in the past, it was larger species that tended to live through extinction events the longest. In the future, it's exactly, exactly the opposite of that pattern. There's a couple of nuances. There's other things about species that can help them survive uh, extinction events. Um, in particular, the range of the species, how much of the planet uh, it uses to, to call its home. Some species are relatively uh, have relatively small ranges. They only live in certain places uh, in the oceans. Maybe they only live in Monterey Bay or the Gulf of Mexico um, or even the Atlantic Ocean. Other species are global and that larger size range generally means less of a risk of, of extinction uh, than a, a, smaller, a smaller size range. Overall, however, um, the larger species uh, in the future, no matter what their size range, are more susceptible to, to extinction patterns. All along, we've been talking about size as a, as a um, basically looking at individual organisms, um, whales, fish, uh, even mollusks, even large mollusks. But uh, there is another way of being big, and that's exemplified uh, by corals, 
corals are colonial animals. Uh, they're made up of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of tiny polyps, each with a little mouth and tentacles around. And as the animal grows, it adds polyps, it adds units. It's almost like uh, leaves on a tree are individual units. Trees grow by adding leaves. Corals grow by, by adding polyps. Uh, they can grow almost indefinitely, adding polyps after polyp after polyp at the edge of where they're growing. Um, and then as they essentially age and grow, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a different kind of growth than say a whale, which gets up to almost adult size and then pretty much stays at that size for the rest of its life. Corals and other colonial animals keep adding parts as they grow. If it's a good year, they'll grow, add lots of polyps. If it's a bad year, maybe they'll shrink. Um, maybe they'll stay the same. Their size is an index of age, but it's not a perfect predictor of age. And then as they grow bigger, um, the ecology of the polyp stays pretty much the same. The environment it's in might change. Say a polyp living in the middle of this colony uh, has a different kind of environment than a polyp living right at the end. Um, but the animal itself is an accumulation of small animals. And so it has a different kind of growth and a different kind of association with, with size. Uh, this big coral in American Samoa um, is estimated to be about 500 years old or so. And its sum total of its mass, considering all of the skeleton inside there, is bigger than a blue whale. But each of those polyps in and of themselves um, is a very small unit of, of, of animal. And the dimensions that are important to that are whether that, those individual polyps can feed and grow and reproduce. Um, unlike the blue whale, that has to, one gulp has to feed the entire, the entire whale. In each of these cases, each polyp has to feed itself. Um, these animals also live a very long time. Um, they're almost immortal. They can break up and they can grow regrow big colonies from small fragments, all different kinds of growth rates and different kinds of patterns than we'd see in a solitary animal like, like a blue whale. Um, but the ocean is full of these kinds of animals, colonial ones, sponges, gorgonians, um, tunicates, uh, and make up a very different way of living life in the ocean and then getting big.